Here we record it. Um, so now it is my very great um, my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker. So um, Dr. Smita Serka is an associate professor at the Center for Philosophy in uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, Jawaharlal, sorry, Nehru University in New Delhi. She has a faculty at, she was a faculty at the Center for Advanced Studies in Philosophy in Jadapur University in Kolkata, and was also associated with the School of Cognitive Science in Jadapur University for several years. Her areas of interest are philosophy of cognitive science, philosophy of mind, moral reasoning, philosophy of mathematics, and reasoning and rationality. She's published in the areas of philosophy of mind, cog science, philosophy of moral reasoning, and philosophy of mathematics. She has collaborated with the project on intellectual humility and cultural diversity in philosophy, headed by Stephen Stitch. Oh, and Edward Mastery, I know him. Um, she was also part of the ICSSR dash NWO exchange program in 2010, which is basically something which allowed her to visit the University of Amsterdam and work on the project Factors Indicating Variation in Patterns of Reasoning in Schooled and Unschooled People Across Cultural Study um, with Michael van Lambalgen. I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name. So, you know, that's our speaker. Dr. Serka is very accomplished and has worked in many eras, and she's here today to talk to us about Indian logic. Uh, Take it away, Dr. Sarkar. Thank you, Liam, for the generous uh, introduction. And I also thank the organizing team of the seminar, Dominic, Zenle, Azita, and Catherine, for giving me this opportunity to present a talk on Indian logic. Um, my, the title of my presentation is uh, slightly altered because I will only be focusing on uh, I hope it's visible. It's only on nature of proof in Indian logic, analyzing epistemological presumptions. Now this talk will focus uh, on one of the systems of logic in India amongst many others like Buddhist logic, Jaina logic, Navvanaya logic, uh, so we will concentrate on the old Nair logic and show the basic structure of its system of argumentation. Now, systems of Indian logic have undergone multiple interpretations by Western scholars in their attempts to decipher the nature of these systems of argumentation, trying uh, to situate them compare them with and within the known framework of Aristotelian logic. We will highlight some of the, uh, some such interpretations or views which were contested and shown why the, these interpretations are misplaced, uh, prejudiced and biased by Indian scholars. Through this, I mean, though this historical presentation is not comprehensive uh, in this talk, we do get a glimpse of the views that were entertained and perpetuated among scholars. Uh, the following part of this talk will briefly discuss the tradition of debate in ancient India, which is very important the different types of debates and the specific purposes behind such classifications. Uh, this discussion will help us situate and understand Nair logic. As you can see, I have uh, written old, which we call it Prachin, which means old Nair logic, vis-a-vis -vis later development of Nair logic, which is called Navya or new Nair logic but I will only be concentrating on old Nair logic. So uh, we will discuss uh, Nair logic, which is considered to be the first systematic present or systematized presentation of how to conduct good argumentation to participate in debates. We further show why this system or any system of logic in India was grounded in Pramana theory, which is Pramana means sources of valid cognition or true cognition. 
to argue why it had epistemological presumptions. So uh, just to present certain historical views on Indian logic, uh, Jonathan Vaneri in his paper, The Hindu Syllogism, colon, 19th century perceptions of Indian logical thought have reconstructed what he calls to be the, I quote, the 19th century perceptions of the logical and rationalist trends in Indian thought among European logicians and historians of philosophy. The period that he's considering is from 1825 to 1860. He says, uh, the assumption that the West and the West alone had developed a science of reason was a fundamental action in the justification of the colonial enterprise as a civilization process. The gradual emergence of evidence that this assumption was false threatened to expose the more primitive basis of empire in relations of power, domination, and economic gain. H. T. Colebrook, who was an eminent mathematician and an Orientalist, he based his study of Indian rationalist thought on Nyaya Sutra by Gautam, who uh, again is from the Prachin uh, Nyaya School of Logic. Um, he reported, Colebrook reported his discovery of what he refers to as the Hindu syllogism at the Royal Asiatic Society in 1824. Now, this public lecture at the Asiatic Society it bore significance, as Vaneri observes, as it not only generated a lot of interest in Indian science of reason amongst logicians like Boole, Hamilton, de Morgan, but Colebrook also introduced the, uh, the European philosophers to Indian materials whose subject matter seemed akin to ideas of the Greek philosophers. And he presented the Indian account of reasoning, as I said, as Hindu syllogism. Now the reactions uh, to this discovery, were, uh, they were mixed. So few like de Morgan, Muller accepted the independent development of logic in India some like some were curious to trace the connection between Greek philosophy and its ideas on the one hand and the Nai system of logic on the other hand, as many considered the possibility of Greek influence on Indian philosophical ideas. The other extreme that we find is a complete denial of the capability of Indian minds to produce any system of logic. So these are the three main kinds of views that we have, that we normally get. Now, this talk uh, is not about exploring a detailed account of this historical narrative, primarily for two reasons. One is, unless we understand the structure and nature of old Naya logic, we cannot to an extent comprehend the full import of such interpretations and criticisms. And secondly, once we have a background of this logic, we can independently have their own impressions. We can have our own impressions and appraisals of these interpretations. Hence, I will just present some quotes to get a glimpse of the prevalent narrative. De Morgan, he says in syllabus of a proposed system of logic, he says, the two races which have founded the mathematics, those of Sanskrit and Greek languages have been the two which have independently formed systems of logic. So this was the first kind of view where they acknowledged uh, in uh, acknowledged logic being developed independently in ancient India. On the contrary, 
We have a quote from Blakey, his historical sketch of logic. It's a bit of a longish quote, but I uh, would read it true. He says, I have a great doubt of such logical views becoming of any value, whatever is the cause of general knowledge or science, or of ever having any fair claim to be admitted as an integral part of the Catholic philosophy of mankind. It is absurd to conceive that a logic can be of any value from a people who have not a single sound philosophical principle, nor any intellectual power whatever, to work out a problem connected with human nature in a manner that, that is all rational or intelligent. Reasoning, at least in the higher form of it among such semi-barbarous nations, must be at its lowest ebb nor does there seem to be any intellectual stamina in such races of men to impart to it more vigor and rationality. So this was the other extreme. Uh, I mean, the again, Hamilton, I mean, this is a short quote, but one can get an idea of what he thinks about in the zoologism uh, as a, as extremely clumsy in its presentation, mode of presentation. Now, as the uh, Nair system of logic was translated and comprehended as Hindu syllogism, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a prevalent Aristotelian model of syllogistic logic, much of the criticisms pointed to the lack of rigor, systematicity, and redundancy of the Nye syllogistic argumentation based solely on a comparative approach. Many Indian thinkers have countered this reading of Nye logic. However, these issues will not be raised. We will go into the form of argumentation that we had in old school of Nye. The other opinion is by Rohr, who wrote in Division of the Categories of the Nye Philosophy that Hindu philosophy will have any great influence on the development of European philosophy and immediately of European civilization must be denied. You are compelled to think by reading the works of the Greeks. They introduce you to the process of their thoughts and by this force you to accompany and by this force you to accompany them with their own thoughts until you arrive as it were by your own mind and the principles of their systems. The Hindus, on the other hand, are dogmatical. They commence synthetically with a statement of their principles, yet do not condescend to unfold the train of thought which has led them. So this is again a kind of a negative reading of Indian logic. Taneri sums it up very well in uh, his writing and he says that the picture of Indian rationalist thought as moribund and in particular of the Indian syllogism as a clumsy barnacled version of its proper Aristotelian form. Uh, now, having given this, given this brief historical um, glimpse of what it was, the kinds of perceptions we had, uh, let us now move on to see what the tradition of debate uh, has been in ancient India as the understanding of this, it builds the foundational stage for understanding the development of logic in India in ways that it, they have. Now, the development of uh, systems of logic in ancient India owes its tradition to what we call as Vada Vidya. Vad means debate. So it's, it was a discipline that dealt with the categories of debate over various philosophical, moral, religious, doctrinal issues. Now, one had to learn. It was kind of an essential qualification. One had to learn the art of debate which was considered essential for a philosopher, where one learns not only how to conduct a debate successfully, 
one also has to locate the loopholes in the opponent's argument. And that came as part of training. And learning to identify the pitfalls that one should avoid, uh, which the opponent might uh, kind of use as a ploy to defeat the other side. So one had to be extremely careful of these surreptitious moves. Uh, so there were manuals of debates, manuals of uh, Vada and Nai Sutra is considered more systematic than others. So this is another reason why we are doing Nai Sutra of Gautama for today. Uh, the traditions that we had, Gautama said, uh, I mean, according to him, debates were of three kinds. The first one is called an honest debate, where we aim to establish our thesis, or the proponent would try and establish uh, a thesis by fair means. Uh, the second type is called Jalpu, which is a kind of a tricky debate where uh, one has to win either by fair or unfair means, right? And which may not at the end necessarily coincide with the establishment of truth. In case of Bada, that is honest debate, both sides are honestly trying through logical arguments to establish what is the truth. In Jalpo, that is not the case. So one can end up with uh, not establishing what is a true thesis by examination. The third kind is called a destructive debate, which is which we call to be bitonda, where the only purpose, the sole aim is to defeat the opponent, right? So these were broadly the three kinds of debate that Gautama talked about in Nai Sutra. Now, the reason why this is important is this was mainly a very rigorous training for a student or a disciple belonging to any particular school of thought to master. So Bada was the most coveted kind of argument because it was an honest argument. Both parties were trying to establish a thesis that they examined to be true. So Vada, as a debating technique, it was said that it should have the following characteristics. The first is that there is a thesis and a counter thesis which are mutually opposing each other, right? So this is the first characteristic of a debating situation. The second is you either prove the thesis, so either, either the thesis uh, can be proved either by means of establishing one's own thesis or by dis disproving or refuting the other. And this whole process should be based on evidence, which is called pramana, and argument, which we call tarko. So these are the two techniques, these are the two tools that we use either to prove or to disprove a thesis. The third characteristic is both sides, the proponent and the opponent, should specify the five steps in a demonstration of one's reasoning. NS stands for Naya Sutra. And since Naya Sutra, it was written in forms of aphorisms. So these number indicate the particular aphorism where this particular uh, point is made. So this and the fourth characteristic is that the reasoning of either parties it should not entail any contradiction with previously accepted or established doctrine. Now, this the third point, that is 
having to specify the five steps in a demonstration becomes extremely important. I mean, that, that forms the crux of NIA logic, which we will see in a short while. So thus, a good debate is one in which there is proof and refutation of the thesis and antithesis respectively, based on proper evidence and argument. Jolpo, which is which we call to be the tricky debate, it, it has the first two characteristics of Vadam, which is honest debate, along with a third one. So the third and the fourth of Vada is not here. It has a new condition characteristic is, that is proving and rebuttal are based on various techniques like equivocation, false rejoinders and sensors of other kinds. So these are the uh, tools that they use, uh, which are kind of tricks, Cholo, Jati, these are kinds of uh, tricks that one can use in order to defeat or to win uh, himself. So hence, since they use these kinds of techniques, it is called a tricky debate. In, in case of a good debate, in case of Bada, we do not find the use of such techniques. The third, which is called Bitonda, is a variation of the second kind but the winner here is not expected to establish any thesis. So at the end of the debate, one can find that there is no establishment of any thesis or counter thesis. Uh, so this type was called explicitly as destructive and negative. And many Indian thinkers, <clears throat> denounce this mode of debating because at the end, you do not have, you do not establish any thesis, right? Uh, so therefore, this kind of debate was not encouraged. Now, in Naya Sutra of Gautam, these were the three kinds, but later on, I mean, we always find other schools uh, modifying or bringing in more classifications, just to complete the classification, many have said that Bitonda can be done in an honest way, which kind of tags along with as Badu Bitonda, and, or it can be done in a tricky way. The rejection can be done in a tricky way, which they call to be the Jalpu Bitonda. Now, this is not, <clears throat> Uh, what is there in Naya Sutra. So the points that we must note from this tradition of debate is one, that logic in India, it never developed as an independent discipline. Logic was never an independent branch of study. It can its, its root is always located in one, the Bada tradition, which lays down the principles of argumentation used in debates. And the second is the Pramana tradition, which discusses inference as one of the sources of sound knowledge. So logic in India, you talk about any school of logic in India, they will be kind of embedded in both Bada tradition as well as Pramana tradition, because inference is seen as, inferential knowledge is seen as a source of valid cognition or true cognition. Now, if we look at the condition C of the Bada debate, and this is, uh, I repeat the condition here, where they have to specify their reasoning in, in five steps, in a form of a five-step demonstration. And this was the first indication in history of logic in India. This was the first 
indication of the five step schema of argumentation. Uh, let us now come to the Prachin Nye's theory of inference. So, as we said, that, and here we will only be concentrating on Bada, that is the good debate. You see, the other which I should have mentioned is Bada is mainly uh, a good debate usually takes place between a teacher and a student. Uh, Jalpo takes place between proponents of two different schools. So they, they are treated as rivals. So they may use Jalpo as a technique of debating. Now, the aim of a good debate was to engage in argumentation that is both honest and non heuristic in nature. So what we have, so one always had the aim, the, the, the only aim was to establish a thesis, either of side A or of side B. Now, so what was required in this form of argumentation was you had a proof of thesis or refutation of antithesis. The second one is, I'm reiterating these points because these are all elements which are to be found in any good debate. You cannot have a good debate which does not have Pramana. The third is you provide Torku, which are presumptive assumptions. Then you have the employment of five step schema of argumentation and followed by no contradiction, nowhere in your presentation of your arguments will have any contradiction uh, to any assumed background knowledge. So these are the criteria which one had to keep in mind in, while engaging in Vada. Now, uh, Ganeri, uh, in, in cases of good debates, uh, Ganeri puts forth the following questions that implicitly kind of indicate the relevance of the five step schema of inference. The questions are quite pointed, so it will not be difficult to understand. The first is how are these arguments to be assessed or evaluated? The second is are the criteria of assessment formal to do only with form of argument schema itself? Do we just study the form of the five step argument schema? Or are they informal? They are pragmatic in nature uh, where we use pragmatic criteria according to which arguments have to be evaluated as good or bad with regard to their contribution towards the goals of the dialogue in which they are embedded. Now, before we go to explain the five step schema of argumentation, Gautama mentions certain uh, points which are part what he calls to be the prior stage of NAI. Now, NAI uh, is basically what we understand, one of the understandings of NAI is it kind of gives us a method of philosophical argumentation. So Gautama gave us this method of philosophical argumentation, which we call to be the NAI model, and which basically gives us an ideally organized philosophical disputation. Uh, he says that there are seven categories to be considered, which constitutes what he calls to be the prior stage of NAI before the argumentation starts. This kind of gives us an idea as to why, as an epistemic agent, one engages in this kind of an argument or a debate. So he says that there, it always 
starts with an initial doubt. We call it shamsha. Uh, whether P or not P is the case. So following a doubt, there is what he calls to be a purpose, prayajan. Because the parties who are engaging in Bada uh, will want to engage in an epistemic inquiry to know whether P is true or not P is true. The third uh, is example. There is always use of examples, which are not backwards, which are not imaginary. There is always use of such examples because they don't want the arguments, the content of the arguments to be backwards or to be empty. So there is always use of examples in the five step schema of argumentation. So therefore, there is this stress of empirical information, producing empirical information. The fourth is what he calls to be the basic tenets uh, and they usually supply the ground rules for the argumentation. The fifth one is, again, uh, I always highlight, I have highlighted it in red and bold, are the limbs of an argument, limbs of the formulated reasoning. Each step is uh, called obaya. Now, since there are five steps, we call it poncho obaya. Poncho meaning five. Now, these are the most important formulations of the structure of a logical reasoning because your entire argument is kind of given in these five steps, which makes or breaks an argument. And Motilal says that this formulation of a five-step argument, I mean, it has proved to be a landmark in the history of Indian logic. The sixth is what uh, we call torko or supportive argument. This is needed when uh, the opponent or the other side uh, raises doubt about what is being presented in the five step in, uh, inference schema. So if there are any questions, I'll show the area from where Torpo starts. It may start if there is a doubt. Uh, so one has to provide supportive arguments. The seventh step is the decision. You finally come to a decision that P or not P, whatever may be the case. So these are the seven steps which Gautama uh, says to be prior to any NAI argumentation. Now let us uh, see what the five steps are. As I said, it's called poncho avayo because poncho means five. I am at places repeating myself so that uh, things are clear since I'm using certain technical jargons from Indian philosophy. Now, the first step that we have in this is what we call to be the tentative state uh, statement of the thesis that, that we want to prove. So we, uh, it's called pratigya. And it looks like there is fire on the hill. So this is a statement that I want proved right or i wanted to prove to the other uh, to the other party the second step is called statement of reason or evidence i uh, i have to give evidence in the second step itself which is called hetu and the statement goes like for there is smoke the third step is the example udaharan and we say, let's say, wherever there is smoke, there is fire, as in the kitchen. The fourth step, it shows the present thesis as a case that belongs to the general case 
that is the application of reason and example to in case at hand. We call it Upanay and the formulation of that step is something like, this is such a case, smoke on the hill is such a case. The fifth step that we say is assertion of the thesis as proven or nihoma. And the formulation is, therefore it is so, that is, there is fire on the hill. So these are the five steps. So we have the tentative statement of the thesis followed by the reason why I'm saying it, followed by a Uda, an example which shows why I'm saying, uh, bringing in a kind of a homologue, a kind of a similar case which I have experienced before. The fourth one is I'm showing that in, in the present case, both the Hetu and the example applies. And fifth is the Nigamon, that is, so this is the case. So if you look at it, these are the five steps that uh, goes into the five uh, step schema. There is fire on the hill for there is smoke. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire as in the kitchen. This is a case that is smoke on the hill. Therefore, it is so that is, there is fire on the hill. Now, to you, so what we are doing in this certain instance of inference is, so our inferential knowledge at the end is that the hill has fire or the hill is fiery. So what we do here is an unseen fire is inferred to be present on the hill on the basis of our perception, let's say, of a plume of smoke, just as the two, that is smoke and fire, have been found associated in other places like the kitchen. So this is the basic model of the argument. Now, if we observe the general schema of the five-step argumentation, the fundamental idea is that something or a particular object is inferred to have a property. Here, the hill is inferred to have the property of possessing fire, which is unobserved on the hill on the ground. So the evidence is that the object has another observed property. That is, I see a plume of smoke on the hilltop. So, Therefore, the sentence, I mean, the conclusion is there is fire on the hill because there is smoke on the hill. Now, just to bring in a little bit of the technical jargon here is the terms. I mean, these are the three crucial terms, fire, hill, and smoke, which, so hill is the location which I claim to possess the property of having fire, which is unobserved from the observation, from the perception of smoke on the hill. So the fire is called the shanto, which is the inferable property or probandum. Smoke is called the hitu, that is probands, on the basis of which I infer that there is fire on the hill. And hill is the boksho or the locus or the object on which I am inferring the property of having fire. So here, uh, given this structure, it, I mean, this uh, I'm borrowing from Ganeri. He says, just to make it a little bit more um, easier, I guess, so he says that let's take capital F to be the property that serves as reason, right? Which is, reason is called hetu, which is smoke in this case. G be the property whose presence we are seeking to infer, and, right? We are seeking to infer fire, which is called shabdhu. Small a is the new property or the 
about which we are trying to decide if it has G or not, if whether hill has fire or not. So A is hill or pokshu. And there is an example that we use, that is the example of kitchen, where we have found the presence of both fire and smoke. Now, Bachchan, who is a commentator on Gautam Snayashutra, his interpretation is based on the similarity between A and B. One can infer their sharing of F, which means something like this, like A is like B. Both are F. You infer G for B, therefore A will also have G. Now, a counter thesis can always be given in terms of their dissimilarity. Now, if uh, probably this will help, so the proof based on similarity would be, these are the five steps. You have the thesis, which is GA, the hill has smoke. Uh, the, sorry, the hill is fiery, the, uh, there is hill, there is fire on the hill. That's the way we have written. There is fire on the hill. The reason F A, because there is smoke, right? So hill has smoke. Example is F B. And we have the claim that B is similar to A, right? So both have the property F, that is kitchen. So the uh, sentence was, Step three was wherever there is smoke, there is fire as in the kitchen. The application of it is, this is such a case. That is, there is smoke on the hill. Therefore, GA, which says, therefore, the, there is fire on the hill or this hill has fire. The counterproof can be, if one can give a counterproof to this, would be of this form not G A, reason F, F prime A, example. I'm not really explaining this. I mean, it's better to stick with one kind of proof here, but just to give an alternate how the uh, structure of the counter proof would be like is given here. Uh, the two things that we have to remember is that in spite of this, uh, I mean, of course, the, all the five steps are absolutely necessary. You can't leave out any step and because each of the steps would have their own uh, reasons for being there. But one must also note the importance of Hetu and Udhar. Uh, there are many other, I mean, I should have said, I mean, there are many more uh, layers of um, this logic, but I'm just presenting the basic structure of it. Now, why is Hetu, which is treated as reason or evidence, so important? Because they have a concept of, uh, and Hetu is what we call to be the probands. Now, there, there is something which they call to be pseudoproban, which looks like a hitu, a real hit, a genuine hitu, but is really not so. So what we have is something called a pseudoproban. Now one must be extremely careful not to use a pseudoproban in his or her argument. And this is an important category, which is similar to reason or evidence. But what it lacks is the logical force to prove the thesis adduced. So hence, a debater should be aware of employing such pseudo evidence in her arguments, which will eventually lead to a defeat situation, right? And be further aware of pseudo reasons employed by opponents, right? So one has to be careful not to use pseudoprobands in his or her own arguments and also be careful whether the opponent is using any pseudoproband in his or her argument because hetu or probands is 
the reason, right, that is provided in the second step. So use of such defective reason is self-defeating. De now, therefore, what uh, Gautam mentions uh, is that Hitu in order to be a genuine Hitu, right, a reason in order to be a genuine evidence, it needs to have five essential characteristics, what they call to be five essential marks, so that they have the capacity to generate infallible inferences, right? Now, if there is a defect in the Hetu, if there is a defect in the reason, we call it Hetu Dosh, the Hetu and therefore the argument will be rendered useless. Uh, just to say, I mean, cases where there, I mean, cases either intentionally or unintentionally, if we use, um, I mean, defective hetu, it is called hittabhash. That's a kind, I mean, those are the different kinds of fallacies that an argument can have. I'll not go into those details in this particular talk. Now, I, I'll just run through the different marks that are required for a hetu to be genuine. <clears throat> is the reason or, right, must be present in the case under consideration. So the, the hetu must be present in Puksha. That is something which is, an, I mean, that, that has to be there. Otherwise, there is no point in talking about this particular hetu. So the smoke has to be in the hetu. Second is the reason must be present in another case similar to the case under consideration, which we call to be the homolog, right? So the hetu must be present in sapoksha, I mean, uh, like in kitchen. The third one is it must not be present in cases which are not, which are dissimilar to the case under consideration. So the inferable property should not be present in any heterolog. So therefore, the Hetu must not be present in Vipaksha. The fifth one is, I'll just run through them. It's not essential that we uh, do these in details right now. The fourth one is, it must be such, the Hetu must be such that the proposition it tries to establish should not contradict, which we have said earlier, that it should not contradict any other earlier established, already established, thesis. We, we call it Abhatitattva. The final one is that it must be such, the Hetu must be such, that there should not be another reason or ev evidence establishing the opposite thesis. Right? So we must be aware of such Hetu or evidence. Now, uh, the other thing is the importance of examples. Right now, it it has to have this one particular step, which is a singular proposition, and it insists on an actual instantiation of the implication rule, which is drishtantu, which means example. So, a case where the rule is illustrated has to be shown. Now, Mutilal says that the requirement about instantiation made another point in Indian logic, a point that was left ambiguous in the traditional Western logic, the universal proposition that might express the implicative premise must, must not have its subject class as empty. Now coming to the last part of my talk is, as I said, that there was no development of logic as an independent discipline in India, and it had its roots in both the Bada tradition as well as the Pramani tradition. And therefore, there is a strong rootedness in epistemological uh, background. Now, the first thing is uh, over and ever, I mean, uh, the truth preserving aspect and inference should have <clears throat> also a truth giving aspect. 
So the theory of inference not only lays down the conditions of validity, consistency, but also of soundness. Uh, for inference as an accredited source of knowing the world, inference is taken as a valid means to know the world. Validity, simply validity of arguments is never enough in Indian logic. The two other requirements is it should have soundness and also there must be some epistemic advancement and epistemic progress must be guaranteed <clears throat> in an inference. Sorry. The third is the NAI theory of inference explains how we know certain facts through the mediation of our knowledge of other facts. So that is our background knowledge which we use or which we apply in cases of our inferential knowledge, which is explicit while we give, let's say, examples in the five step schema of argumentation. Now, the other thing is that no constituent of an inference can have zero information content. It cannot be vacuous. It cannot say, it, it, it cannot have an empty content. Uh, so validity of an inference was never delayed from soundness. So now comes a valid yet unsound argument of fallacy because for the simple reason that it does not generate any knowledge. So you, you are employing uh, inferential techniques, you are drawing inference, but there is no knowledge coming out of it. It doesn't have soundness, it doesn't talk about facts of the world, is something that is unimaginable in Indian logic. So it's not just the form, but it's not just sorry the not just the form and validity of argument it also is always hyphenated with soundness of the argument thank you that would be all and these are some of the references 